ambassador to the United Nations and to Russia whether at this point it is better off for the United States to leave or to stay in Afghanistan. The consequences of staying are probably keeping 2,500 American troops training Afghans who have demonstrated over the last five years an inability to increase their capacity to protect their own country. And in a situation where the help that we need from Pakistan in dealing with the Taliban has never been really truly forthcoming. To put the Afghanistan pullout in a larger perspective, we welcome now Bloomberg's Bill Ferries, who heads our national security coverage. So, Bill, thank you for being here. Uh, give us your take, at least from Washington. Uh, looking back on this almost 20 years now, was this a success story or not for the United States? Well, it was a success story early on, uh, clearly when the U.S. forces ousted, very quickly ousted the Taliban and made gains um, against uh, the al-Qaeda remnants that were there, although they didn't initially get uh, Osama bin Laden, which was the uh, original reason for going in. They have taken down the leadership uh, uh, many times of al-Qaeda, so in that sense there's been a success. Um, but they have you know, clearly really struggled to rebuild this country, to make it any kind of a functioning democracy, to uh, train the armed forces in a way that uh, they could help defend the country. The Taliban at this point uh, have, uh, are basically at their greatest strength since being ousted from power. And there's a real fear among uh, people on both parties about whether the Taliban will ultimately just take power uh, soon after American forces pull out. Well, that's just the question. I mean, too many of us remember those videos in Vietnam, uh, actually, of the, the, the departure of the U.S. and what happened then. Uh, is the Taliban likely to take over on uh, September 12th or thereabouts? It, it, it's gonna, it could happen very quickly. That's the real fear. And then the question is, do they also provide, again, a home for terrorist groups who have international, uh, international goals? So uh, they, have had the, uh, they have had kind of the winning hand in recent years. They've kept the government on the defensive, and they have the momentum. And, uh, and frankly, they haven't had to give up much in terms of uh, these peace talks between the Afghan government uh, uh, and the U.S. And the, uh, and the Taliban forces. Okay, thank you so much to Bloomberg's Bill Ferries for that report on the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. Once again, we are waiting for Fed Chair Jay Powell to begin his interview with David Rubenstein, which we will bring you when it gets underway. To set up that discussion, we welcome now Bloomberg Managing Editor for the U.S. Economy. She is Peggy Collins. So, Peggy, thank you so much for being with us. We're hearing a fair amount, I think it's fair to say, from Chair Powell these days. At the same time, the numbers basically from the economy continue to come in quite strong. Can you have too much of a good thing? Well, I think that's the big debate right now. So we saw unprecedented stimulus on both the fiscal government aid side and on the monetary policy Fed side in the pandemic to try and hold up the economy and help people and small businesses get through the worst of it. Now we're coming out of that, and the question is whether or not we might see prices take off in a way that is troubling for the economy. The Fed is saying, look, we expect prices to rise to see a bounce in inflation in the next several months as pent-up demand unleashes, people reopen and start shopping again. We're expecting that, um, but the question is whether or not that will be more than they expected. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Which like a problem. I see out of the corner of my eye now, we see Jay Powell, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, talking with David Rubenstein. Let's go now to Washington, the Economic Club. Measures too suppress its spread and then ultimately vaccination so that's been the most important driver of the economy uh, we of course all through this have consulted externally with lots of experts but we've also developed significant in-house expertise over the course of now more than a year so we do monitor that still very very carefully uh, of course so let's talk about the president's uh, stimulus bill the 1.9 uh, trillion dollar stimulus bill um, at the time that it was proposed, uh, Larry Summers, a former Secretary of the Treasury, said that he thought it might be too big and might be somewhat inflationary. It was uh, the output gap is roughly $500 billion, this was $1.9 trillion. Uh, you, I believe, supported the, uh, the uh, legislation, thought it was appropriate for the economy. Do you have any concern that we are going to be producing inflation as a result of the stimulus bill or do other things that might get you... Uh, to be more worried about the economy because of the size of that stimulus bill. So we, um, at the Fed, we have very specific jobs. We're a creature of statute, and we have very specific jobs that we handle on be that Congress has given us, and that's for monetary policy. It's stable prices and maximum employment. We also supervise and regulate banks. We deal with the payment systems and all that. One thing we don't do 
is give Congress or the administration advice on fiscal policy. So I've never, and, and we don't uh, traditionally, take a position in favor or opposed to legislation. We didn't do that for the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, mm -hmm. and we didn't do it for really any of these uh, these acts. Uh, w w you know, uh, that's just not something that we do. We have a narrow mandate and precious independence, so uh, we, we try to stay in our lane and not comment on, on things that Congress might do on fiscal policy. Okay. Well, let's just talk about, let me try it another way. Are you worried about debt and deficits? Uh, the debt is uh, pretty high, $27 trillion or so, and the annual deficit is now about 2 and a half to $3 trillion or so. Um, is that a concern to the Fed in terms of impacting inflation? So, yes, in, in the um, over time and in the longer run, the U.S. federal budget is on an unsustainable path meaning simply that the debt is growing meaningfully faster than the economy, and that's by definition unsustainable over time. It's a different thing to say that the current level of the debt is unsustainable. It's not. The current level of the debt is very sustainable, and there's no question of our ability to service and, and issue that debt for the foreseeable future. Um, I, I would also say, though, that as a, as a nation, we, we will have to eventually get back to a sustainable path that is something that is best done in very good times when the economy is at full employment and when taxes are rolling in. This is not the time to prioritize that concern, but it is nonetheless an important concern that I believe we will ultimately have to return to again when the economy is strong. Now, you have previously said, I just want to ask you if you feel the same way now, that currently you do not expect the Federal Reserve to increase interest rates before the end of 2022. Is that a correct a view of uh, what you've said? So here's what we've said. We've said that we would expect to keep interest rates where they are today until three particular outcomes are achieved in the economy. The first is that the recovery in the labor market is effectively complete. The second is that inflation has reached 2% and really reached it, not just sort of tapped the base, as I like to say, but has reached sustainably. And the third thing is that inflation is on track to run moderately above 2% for some time. Those are the tests. So we are really focused on the progress of the economy toward those goals and not on a particular time frame. When we get those three boxes checked, that's when we'll consider raising interest rates and that's when we'll, that's when we'll raise interest rates. Until then, we won't. So what you're referring to, I think, is we all write down these projections every quarter in the March, June, September, and December FOMC meetings, write down individual projections, and we submit those, we tabulate them and publish them. And most, most members of the committee did not see raising interest rates until 2024, but that isn't a committee forecast. It isn't something we vote on or, or act on as a group. It really is just our own uh, assessment. And uh, so I, I think there's a tendency of markets to, to focus too much on, the, on what we call the dot plot, the summary of economic projections. And uh, I, I would focus more on on the outcomes that we've described and and uh, as the best assessment we can make of our progress toward achieving those. Okay, but based on what you know today, uh, you would not expect to increase interest rates before 2022, or you're just not saying that yet? Well, before 2022, that would be this year. I think that would be highly unlikely. I, 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 don't, you. I don't talk about particular I don't think don't there's a like use in that, so, but it, it really is outcome-based. Okay. But let me ask you, uh, last time the Fed did increase interest rates, um, it did so um, for, by a little bit, and then it started uh, shrinking its balance sheet a bit. Um, do you have any view on whether that's the right way to proceed when you begin to increase interest rates? Should you increase interest rates and then shrink the balance sheet later, or should you begin to shrink the balance sheet and then increase interest rates? Do you have any view on whether one policy or the other is better? So what we did after the global financial crisis was first we uh, we were buying assets and then we, we gradually slowed the pace at which we were buying treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. And then we held the balance sheet constant for a while. After that, we started raising interest rates. We raised them gradually. And at some point we actually, and we held the balance sheet constant. So we don't sell bonds into the market and we, we either, when they mature, we either reinvestment or that we allow them to to run off. So that's what we did last time. I think if you look at the sense of our guidance, it is that we, we will reach we will reach the time at which we will taper asset purchases when we've made substantial further progress toward our goals from last December when we announced that guidance. And that would that would in all likelihood be before 
well before the time we consider raising interest rates. We, we haven't, you know, voted on that order, but that is the sense of the guidance is that it would work in that way. In other words, uh, you, you are likely to follow the same policy of not selling into the market the bonds you already have or other securities, but just let them uh, mature, and then that, that's the way you, you uh, shrink your balance sheet. Is that right? You know, th these are questions which lie ahead of us, but essentially, though, I, I would say it this way. We, the first thing we do is we, we say that we will gradually reduce the pace of our purchases, and then when, when the purchases go to zero, the, the size of the balance sheet is constant, and when bonds mature, you reinvest them. Now, then another step, and we took this late in, late in the day, the last cycle, was to allow bonds to start to run off. And we haven't decided whether to do that or not. We, it, it, we didn't then, and I, I don't think we now would ever actually sell bonds into the marketplace. Okay, um, let me ask you a little bit about the FOMC. People probably don't really know how it works that, that much, but how many members are there of the FOMC? So the, all 12 reserve bank presidents and all of the sitting governors, which is currently six, are what we call participants in the FOMC. So it's the Federal Open Market Committee, and we meet eight times a year. We're doing it virtually now, uh, in, and, but I do it from this uh, beautiful boardroom we have upstairs. Uh, so all of the governors vote at every meeting. That's the six of us. And then five of the reserve bank presidents vote on a rotating basis, on a two- or three-year cycle, depending on which uh, on, on which. A district you represent, except the New York, the New York Fed president always votes as well. So it's a little bit complicated, but the sense of it is that it's a balance between the reserve banks, which are all around the country, and the board, which is here in Washington D.C. and is nominated by the president and confirmed by the Senate. Okay. So in the Supreme Court, when they have conferences among the members, I think the Chief Justice gives his view first, and others, according to seniority, give their views. How does it work at the FOMC? Does the chairman of the board, you, give your views first, or do others speak, and then you give your views? It really depends on the issues and, and, and what we're talking about. And, 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 you know, it's sort of up to me. We, we, the, the order changes. It's not an order of seniority or anything like that. People say, let's say we're going to have a go-around on the economy. People will say, I'd like to go in the middle. I'd like to go at the beginning. I'd like to go at the end. And we, we sort of make the list, and we hand the list around. So I will sometimes go first if I really want to make a point. Often I'll go last and I'll try to sum up and then say what I think the path forward is. It really depends on the situation. Okay. Um, I always worry about the secrecy. So I assume that you have somebody coming in sweeping the room where all these discussions are going to occur or when they're being done virtually, you have the best cyber people in the world to make sure that nothing leaks out. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, you know, of course, we we're, we realize that we're a very attractive, uh, you know, a target for for uh, hacking and cyber attacks of all kinds. And so we invest a great deal of time and money in trying to make ourselves as safe as possible. We also have very strict rules for FOMC participants and their staff uh, for the handling of confidential materials. Uh, I would just say you you never feel like you've done enough. I'm sure you feel the same way in, in business. You just never feel like you've done enough. But we, we try very hard to uh, to be as robust against those kind of penetrations as possible. Okay. So let me ask you about uh, the situation with respect to a couple issues you've talked about, climate change, for example, or racial inequality. Uh, the Fed has not historically been somebody that's supposed to be focused on climate change, and uh, you're focused on the unemployment rate, but not under the statute, whether it's minority unemployment rate or, or white unemployment rate. How do you assess those issues? Uh, do you get criticized from members of Congress when you say we have to worry about, or if you do say that, climate change or its impact on the economy? How do you assess these issues that are not really in your statute but are now important in terms of determining how the economy is moving forward? So there, there are two different issues, and uh, there are differences and similarities, so I'll, I'll talk about them in order. So uh, both, but the point is both of them we see only through, through the eyes, through the lens of our existing mandates. We haven't gotten any new mandates. So uh, to climate change, for example, the, the reason we're focused on climate change is that our job is to make sure that financial institutions, banks, particularly the largest ones, understand and are able to manage the, the significant risks that they take. And the public will expect us to do that. Climate change is just another one of those risks. And increasingly, the large banks very much realize that if you talk to uh, leaders of these large financial institutions are very focused on what climate change is going to mean for their business, for their business model over time. So that's 
it's within the scope of that mandate. In addition, we have responsibilities for the broader financial system. How will climate change affect the broader financial system and markets? And so, so we, 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 we see it only through the lens of that existing mandate. It's, it's similar with, with inequality. Um, we have these persistent disparities, racial, gender, uh, and other uh, disparities in economic outcomes in our economy. And they, they kind of hold the economy back. You know, we all want an economy where everyone has the ability to contribute to and benefit from the prosperity that we, that we have in our, in our great economy. So really with the, our focus is on uh, those, the, the gaps that we face. And we call them out, we talk about them. We've, we've tried to incorporate into our monetary policy framework the thought that, uh, that maximum employment, our statutory goal, is a broad and inclusive goal. That's a reference to, to those issues. And also, I think we now realize that, that uh, unemployment can go low for quite a long time without inflation being a problem, which will also tend to help those groups. I, on that, I would just stress, of course, we, aren't, we can't be the primary uh, policy organization that treats either climate change or inequality. Uh, you know, we, we, we see it through the lens of our existing well, mandates, but yeah. those are very much issues for elected representatives and for other parts of the government, more than they are for us. You mentioned inflation. Let me talk about that or ask you about inflation. Uh, the Fed for quite some time has tried to get 2% inflation, but really hasn't been able to get 2% inflation in our economy. Why do you think it's been so difficult to get inflation at 2% or higher? When I worked in the government many years ago, we had double-digit inflation. I don't think we're getting that again. But why is inflation so hard to get when we have large deficits and, and a lot of government spending? The, the economy has, has really changed since those days. That's, that's when I was in college. And I think uh, people generally attribute the, the quarter of a century of low inflation uh, that we've had to a number of factors. One, one is globalization. One is spread of technology. Another is demographics and the aging population. All of those tend to lead to, to lower inflation. So what we have, in fact, since the global financial crisis for the last decade, you've seen central banks around the world really struggle to reach a 2% goal and in some cases, you know, are, are fighting outright deflation. The reason that's, that's a, a, a difficult thing is that reduces the scope of central banks to react to the economy when it turns down, which can lead to still weaker economic outcomes, lower interest rates, lower inflation. So you can get into a, a cycle, if you will, that's, that's not a productive one. So we really want inflation to be at 2%. We want it to average 2% over time. And that means that we want, to, we want to overshoot 2% after we've been through a period moderately and for some time after we've been below 2% for a while. Well, as you know, bond traders tend to focus on every nuance of everything you say. And so they tend to sometimes exaggerate uh, what you might have meant. But make sure I understand and everybody watching understands, if inflation were to go a little bit above 2% over the next year or so, you wouldn't regard that as a calamity. Uh, is that fair? So we, we seek, um, because inflation has run below 2% for some time, we seek inflation that is moderately above 2% for some time. That, that's, that's our objective. Now, when you say moderately, that means moderately. We don't, we're not going to put numbers on it, but so we'd be comfortable for, indeed, we seek inflation that is moderately above 2%, and that's, that's very well known. Uh, and so for, for, for quite some time, Many people were saying, well, you'll never get above 2% because it has been very hard to get back to 2%. Now, now more of the discussion is on the other side, as you know. So uh, you are the first person in, in quite some time to be the chairman of the Fed who was not a PhD in economics. I think the last one might have been, uh, well, I think Paul Volcker didn't have a PhD, but he was trained as an economist. But since that time, you've had trained economists. You've been trained as a lawyer. Um, is that why you are able to speak in the King's English much better than the economists who've had that job? Because you tend to speak in ways that people actually can understand. Is that a conscious effort or did you just didn't learn uh, how to speak like an economist and therefore you're more easily understood? So it, I do consciously think it's very important it, to speak to the interested public in a way they can understand and to avoid jargon. So every discipline has jargon, and it's, it's a way members of that discipline speak to each other to be very precise about what they mean. But when you use it with the general public, it's just annoying, it's irritating, and it's exclusive, it feels bad. So I try very hard to, enjoy, to, to avoid using, using jargon. And I, and I do think 
I, I think if, if you look at surveys, uh, you've seen these large public and private institutions around the world are really struggling to hold the faith and support of the public. And I think for the Fed, it's it's terribly important that we do engage oh, with the public it's... proactively. We don't look at this as something we got to do. It's absolutely essential to what we do is to speak to the public and the, the public's elected representatives in Congress a lot. Uh, and and sort of gain our democratic legitimacy through that. We 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 need accountability. We need uh, democratic legitimacy, and to do that, we've got to speak clearly and transparently. I've known a number of your predecessors, and I wouldn't say they relished dealing with members of Congress. It wasn't the part that they of the job they liked the most. But you seem to actually, you know, don't dislike it. You've talked to a lot of members of both sides. Um, is that a conscious effort to talk to more members of Congress than maybe some of your predecessors? And do members of Congress tell you all the time uh, you should be doing this or that? And how do you respond when, you know, you're trying to be polite to them? It was very conscious, but it, part of it just was after the hard work done by, you know, Ben Bernanke and Janet Yellen and everyone who was involved to get the, get the economy back to a better place and get the Fed back to a better place. I thought there was an opportunity to really raise our engagement, and I, and I have. And so uh, I, I do spend as much, a great deal of time. I actually enjoy it. Um, I, I go into people's offices and I, I say, I want to hear what's on your mind. And I think they really do appreciate the, the, the dialogue and, and the, all that. And I appreciate it too. I feel like I learn uh, about them and, you know, they tend to be very interesting people and uh, they're interested in what we do. So it seems to work and I'm certainly going to keep doing it. So when I go see members of Congress from time to time, I sit in their waiting room for quite a while to get in. Do uh, you spend more than 30 seconds in a waiting room, or that 30 seconds will be long? You know, it happens all the time. You Sometimes you go up there, and they're voting, and you sit there for an hour, and, and they never they can't go, and you go back, and it's fine. You just That's just part of the deal. We work for them. I mean, we're a creature of Congress. We work with the, effectively the, the House Financial Services Committee and the Senate Banking Committee are the statutory oversight over this agency in our government so i take that very seriously we we uh we take our relationships with the, with them seriously and we want to understand their concerns and we work hard at that now as you pointed out earlier uh there are six members of the federal reserve there's supposed to be seven we haven't had seven for quite a while um do you recommend uh, a seventh person to the president or do you stay out of that and how does the Fed operate without seven? It hasn't operated, hasn't had seven for a long time. Do you think it's okay to operate with five or six? It's certainly okay to operate with five or six. We were down to three for a while. I would say that was more like uh, we had to go to zone defense. You know, it was that was very, very difficult. But with five or six, we're fine. And with seven, we're fine. The way it works, though, is, um, of course, the, the president has the right of nomination. The Senate has the right of confirmation. We have no official role to play whatsoever. As a matter of courtesy, courtesy. As a matter of courtesy, um, traditionally, uh, administrations have, after they've vetted candidates, they will, they will, you know, perhaps send that candidate to be a, a governor over to meet with the Fed chair. Strictly in their discretion to do that or not, but they have often done that, and then, and then the Fed chair really, they're not asking you to identify people. They're saying, is this person okay? And, and you, know, you, you sort of have a nice interview with them. And, and give them your answer. So that's the way it's been traditionally, but really we have no official role and it's completely up to the administration whether they want to do that or not. So I don't think we've ever had a case where a chairman of the Fed later became secretary of the treasury and somebody who was on the Fed board was later became chairman of the Fed like you have. And so is it a little awkward to be kind of in a situation where your former, let's say chair, is now the secretary of the treasury or does it make it easier because you know her so well? Uh, it's not awkward at all. So uh, I think, you know, I worked at Treasury and I worked at the Fed. Uh, uh, Secretary Yellen worked in, in the uh, in the White House on the Council. She was chair of the Council of Economic Advisors. And I think both of us understand that Fed and Treasury have different authorities and different roles, but have a long history of institutionally working together uh, for the for the good of the country. And so we're, and we respect each other. We respect the lines very clearly clear lines, stay in your lane kind of thing. And I, I think we'll have exactly that kind of a, we do have that exactly that kind of a relationship. And I mean, I have no concerns about that at all. And uh, how do you relate to the administration? Typically, uh, chairs of the Fed will have a regular lunch with the Secretary of Treasury. Sometimes even the President of the United States will have some regular contact 
How are you relating to this administration? Do you meet with the Secretary of Treasury regularly or people on the White House staff or the President? How are you doing that? So I think the, the, the way it's, the sort of standard way it's happened it, uh, it has been this, that there's a weekly, you had a breakfast or a lunch between the Secretary of Treasury and the Fed Chair, and it rotates back and forth into each building. That's now a phone call. And, and so that's, that's what I've been doing with Secretary Yellen. In addition, there's been a, an irregular but roughly monthly lunch with the head of the National Economic Council. So there's a relationship there. You know, meetings with presidents and Fed chairs are very, very, very infrequent and, and, uh, and not, not on any sort of a schedule. So I, and I have not met with the president. Uh, and you met him before he was president? Uh, you must have met him at some point, at some point in his life or your life, or you really haven't met him yet? I think I've shaken his hand, I, but I don't, I, I, I have not really met him and talked to him. Okay. Let's talk about what it's like to be the chairman of the Fed. Uh, you know, one day you're, uh, you know, a private citizen and you can go to a restaurant, you can say whatever you want, you can do, you know, anything socially. When you're on the Fed board and then you become chairman, are you constrained in who you can socialize with, what you can say at a restaurant? Uh, if people come up to you and they innocently say, hey, what's going on? What are you working on? What are you supposed to say? I mean, so how does how is life as the chairman of the Fed? So uh, if people don't come up and, and say inappropriate things. That's the thing. You know, they, in fact, they, mostly they don't come up at all. I think even, even people that I know are, are, are reluctant to come up, which is unfortunate because I like to talk to people. But... I haven't had any situation where people have asked anything inappropriate, even sort of unknowingly. You know, but it, it is a different, uh, you, you have security and, and, you know, you have to be very careful about what you say in public places. And, you know, it's it's just part of this life is um, is you, you're, you're, the things you can do are limited uh, and you just have to accept that for the time that you have this job. But, you know, it's such a great job and it's such an honor to do it. I really don't think about that. So if you want to talk to somebody on a cell phone, you have to have a, I would assume a secure cell phone and so forth and all of those things, right? Yes. Yeah. And, you know, in 24 hour security and all those things. So um, when you are um, running the Fed in a pandemic, are you doing it remotely uh, from your home? I know you're now in the Fed building now, but have you been the last year or so mostly working from home or have you been coming into the Fed and working from there? You know, we, um, so we had a, pretty significant FOMC meeting on March 15th, which I think was a Sunday. And that was the last meeting that I did from this building. Uh, that I went home after that. And since March 15th of 2020, have mostly worked from home. Mm -hmm. And um, although lately I'm coming in, I found myself coming in two, three, four days a week, as a matter of fact, more than I used to. I'm not sure why that is, but that is the case. And it was, I would tell you, it was surprising uh, how well uh, our business and our business model were able to adapt to doing work remotely. I think many, many organizations had that experience. We certainly did. So most of the Fed staff people who work at the main building of the Fed, are they coming in now more frequently or are they still working it from home? Almost everyone works, just about everyone works from home exclusively or you know, from wherever they are exclusively. Some people have, some people live elsewhere now or they, you know, they're, they're, uh, calling in from a from a home home someplace that isn't the one they have in the Washington area. You're coming in more frequently because your wife is saying finally it's time to get out of the house and go <laughs> to the office more. Is there some of that, or she's happy? There, there may be some of that involved. involved. There may be some of that involved. Absolutely. So, how do you coordinate with uh, the heads of the central banks in <clears throat> Europe and other countries that are important? Uh, obviously, it's remote now, but are, do you find that you can still communicate with them what they're uh, doing, and do you communicate as well what you're doing uh, remotely? You know, it's very, it's a very, very important part of the job, M more important than I had really understood, I think, uh, before I started doing it. And uh, we need to know each other. The heads of the major central banks need to know each other pretty well and meet regularly and talk. And so that's what we do in Basel, Switzerland. Six times a year we go to Basel and we, we have two and a half days of meetings and, and there's no press or anything like that. So that's that's what we do. Of course, we haven't done that since January of 2020. So we're doing it by telephone. And um, I really highly value those interactions. And I know my international colleagues do too. So we're doing it on the telephone now. And by, you know, by, uh, you know, the secure equivalent of a Zoom call, it's 
it's fine. That's what we'll keep doing for as long as we have to do it that way. I'd say it's better to be in that tower in Basel, having lunch with people, you know, seeing people in the hall, going for walks. And, you know, you just, you, there's just more time to, to really meet privately and talk than there is on the telephone. But I, I stay in touch with a, a good number of my international uh, colleagues. And again, I place a high value on it. I think that that is a good thing to do. The Fed uh, director for the area of uh, that has, I guess, includes Wyoming, uh, often holds an event, I guess it's in August or July, where the major finance people come together in White and Jackson Hole. Um, and that's, again, July or August. Is that going to happen this year in person or you think it's remote again? I, I think they're thinking about that right now. So that's that's the Kansas City Fed and our, our great Kansas City president, Esther George, We'll be making that decision. I'm not sure where they're going to come out on that, um, but we will hold it. It'll be held virtually, I think, as it was last year. At so least in, I, in person. I think you said recently the biggest problem that you're worried about now is cyber, um, mm -hmm. cyber attacks and so forth. Can you elaborate a little bit more why you are so worried about it and how does the Fed um, protect itself? I assume you are uh, subject to lots of people wanting to know what's going on in cyber attacks. I assume you've got great... Uh, ways to prevent that, but can you give us, without telling secrets you can't tell, uh, some of the things that you were worried about in terms of cyber and how you protect your information? Sure. You know, the the question I was answering was really, w will we see a rerun of the global financial crisis with the banks failing and all that? And, you know, we spent 10 years, literally 10 years, strengthening the banks with much higher capital. I can't stress how much higher higher levels of liquidity, much better risk management, um, severely adverse annual stress tests. And I have to say that the banks held up to what was a pretty significant real-time stress test over the course of 2020. So that isn't the main concern I would worry about. it, And, and it really is some kind of a cyber attack. So we, we have a great game plan now for Banks making bad loans and you know uh, housing bubbles and things like that. We we we've, we've got that that game plan. We've got a really strong financial system and capital markets. Cyber is just a it's the new frontier, and I you know that isn't that's not a, a new insight. We we spend a great deal of time and money uh, you know making sure that we are resilient, making sure that the banks they spend a lot of time and money. All of these institutions are you know constantly under cyber attack, and. Um, uh, you know, there's a uh, within the government tremendous resources, very, very capable resources that we work with. I, I wouldn't want to go much into it. You know, we, we, historically we've run these exercises sometimes. You know, scenario analysis where we we run an exercise and see how it happens. We imagine that X happened, and then we get together in a group. Uh, so we'll do we'll keep doing that. I'm sure. But as I as I said before, you you it's one of those things where you never feel like you've done enough, um, and you know. Hey, let's talk about fintech. Um, since you first got into the uh, financial world, the fintech revolution has really changed uh, banking and financial services. Um, how does the Fed regulate some of these new fintech companies that are really not subject under the traditional rules to your regulation? Are you worried about your inability to kind of control some of